does anyone use tidy models in their work or research or kind of day job type thing at the minute? I use it. Um, yeah, it's, um, uh, moment, mostly for um, feature engineering and testing different kind of model types or anything else. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Um, I mostly stole a lot of my techniques from um, business science. Uh, well, rather, I, I've, um, I do a course with um, well, uh, the learning labs from Matt Danko, and um, he's got some really good techniques on there. So I tend to utilize a lot of stuff over there because I've got really good um, time series information. And um, they also use tidy, uh, sorry, time TK and tidy quant and stuff like that. And those are all really well structured packages that are great for time series, whereas a lot of other communities don't do that well with time series. Uh, but yeah, tidy models work just well for that. Yeah, I started to use it a little bit recently at work. It's, I, I do not, but it's it's on my list. I was I was thinking about it, especially with this stuff. I was like, this, yeah, you know, I need to start it. Sorry, Sean. yeah, yeah, me too. I haven't started it, but. Uh... I'm planning to use it. And, and yesterday I was uh, looking at something like machine learning buzz, ML buzz, um, which is like um, kind of uh, using touch, uh, PyTorch uh, in R. Uh, I say this is also another direction in R, right? <laughs> machine learning ML buzz. That's a package, or ML virus? Yeah, ML buzz, uh, touch for R. They are writing also another book um, using PyTorch, uh, using Torch for our ML bus. And uh, let me see. So I think it's now, the, now they have a native like Torch implementation in R. I think, right? Yeah. Torch for R. Yeah, Torch for. R. Yeah, that's us. They're all they're all changing so so fast. It's quite hard to stay on top of, particularly because of the uh, the access to machine learning libraries is really improving for our at the moment quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how tidy models uh, can. I don't, I don't know. I haven't tried it, but does tidy models uh, can you can you use Torch as an engine? Um, I haven't used it. Um, you could use Tensor. Um, I think you should use TensorFlow. I can't, I can't remember. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure you used TensorFlow the other day. I was using XG Boost, um, which comes in anyway, but like you can use, oh, you can access it, uh, use uh, H2O. I think you can plug that in as well. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head because I flit around between systems, but I do find tiny models. I've only started using it recently, but I do find it's really easy to like uh, flick in and out of things when I'm doing feature engineering. Um, so you could just apply the same kind of workflow all the time, which is really nice. But, um, let me have a look. I shut down my whole computer. Yeah, I don't think uh, there's a, like last I checked, uh, they, they have this uh, neural net and uh, tidy models, but it only supports TensorFlow, I guess, using uh, that reticulate, uh, you know, Python linkage. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think there is a specification for torch over there right now. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so today we are, where is, um, we are getting 10 minutes past the time. Um, I don't know if we, start, <laughs> we need to start um, or we should wait again. I don't know. Yeah, I think we should. Sounds start. good to go. Yeah. Oh, Stephen is around. All right, I think, um, Stephen. All right, I think we may start, right? All right, um, am I sharing my screen for chapter seven? Hello. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, thank you very much. Uh, so today we're gonna discuss chapter seven, uh, fitting models with PassNib. So basically, this chapter I adapted it from the um, cohort one, 
um, just with some kind of addition of few things. Um, uh, and this is, uh, these are the learning objectives um, that have been drafted from the book, uh, which we gonna understand uh, how model interface differs from the traditional R and how tidy models try or personally try to make or unify them. And we're gonna understand how to fit the model. So this is a mind map of what we were doing. Uh, the in the last week, we have seen how we can use this package as sample to make some feature engineering um, receipt uh, and also to make receipt. And here we are at this parsnip. Um, so this is a kind of um, uh, mind mapping of what we have seen. And this is where we are, uh, right. And also this is just um, the chapter set of what, what we have already seen in the previous chapter so that we can make some uh, reusable part of it. Right, so let's get going. So um, one of the problem with traditional OBSR models is different model interface, which is uh, very um, somehow problematic in the sense that um, different models use a different interface and people need to understand these kind of differences, uh, no matter how uh, the number of models you want to use. But what we want to do in trying to build a model is basically we want to estimate model parameters. Um, so uh, if you can see here, these are some of the model parameters uh, if we want to create a model. But uh, the base R has some kind of tricky or issue with different models have different interfaces. So different implementation requires different interface. So for example, let's assume we want to model linear regression in different ways. So this is a ordinary least square and regular, regularized linear models. So the packet starts, text formula, and text data frame. So this is a um, common way to build the models, to estimate the model parameters. But LMNate use different interface or use different approach where we have XY interface, not a data frame, but it uses a matrix where we provide the X and Y and if one use, you're gonna use different kind of models, then you should remember which models use data frame, which models use X and Y interface. So there is a need to have some commonalities among all these kind of um, these models. So if you are familiar with um, Python, where in their machine learning package, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you see they have the same commonality where everything you do is the same. So this is the aim of Parsnip to make such kind of interface the same. So this is one of the problem to fit models across different package, the data must be formatted in different ways as we can see here. X or Y. This different require memorization of a purchases and can be very frustrating. Um, so person it comes along to make this interface uniform, one unique. And that's why we have generalized model spe specification approach in person. It. Here is not generalized, um, which is different um, approach. So um, the model specification person it, it categorized into three different way. Uh, the first thing is specify, specify the model type. Um, so for instance, if it is linear, then this is the first step. You need to specify if it is random forest, you need to specify. That is the philosophy of passing it to make unification of the interfaces among different models. 
after you specify the model type, the second thing you need is to specify the engine. Um, so this is the engine. Um, you need to specify just the package implementation. If it is a random forest, you specify it. And the last one, which is optional to declare a mode. So a mode, um, we declare a mode in the sense that we say, okay, this is classification or linear regression. So this declaring of mode is optional. Um, if a package or um, an engine does only one category, for instance, uh, an engine does classification, then it is automatically defined for that. You don't need to specify the mode. If it does linear regression, or, um, uh, if it does class, uh, regression only, you don't need to specify the mode. But if a model does two, both classification and regression, then you can specify the mode by saying if it is regression or if it is classification like random forest. So uh, personally, uh, in attempt to make uniform interface, it used three things, uh, as we can see here, trying to build a model specification. This is the first specify the model. Here we want to uh, build, uh, create a model, uh, just at the previous example we see in the previous section. Um, so here we said, okay, this model is linear regression. So we specify the model. And the next thing is to set the engine, um, LM. Uh, so they set the engine. And the last parameter, as we said, which is to set the mode uh, is optional. As we can see here, we, we needed not to set the, that parameter because it is automatically said. But if, for instance, here we have a uh, random forest, um, we can set um, the, the mode parameter whether we need um, classification or regression. So this is basically um, how the model interface is defined. So, we can see Parsnip um, actually uh, solve the issue of having the uh, different interface. So you can have the same structure for every model. All you need to put is to um, specify the model, uh, the model and also the engine. Uh, so after we specify the model interface, the next thing is to uh, fit the model. Um, so we can fit the model using two ways. The first we can use fit and we can use fit xy. And as you can see here, this is an example of uh, model specification here we define, right? Um, now we can call this method fit and uh, provide this formula. And also we can use this uh, fit xy. So you can see we use the same thing. Uh, so here we fit the model. So. Uh, there is uh, something here they said when fit is used with a model specification, this almost always means that dummy variable will be created from qualitative predictors. Also, when the fit xy function always passes the data as it is to the underlying model function, it will not create dummy variable for doing so. So this stuff, I do not quietly understand the difference between fit only and fit xy. And um, so if anyone um, can jump in and explain what they really mean here, um, can, yeah, it would be appreciated. Um, so what I, I can see here, when we have a model, um, as you can see the previous one, um, if that model has the matrix form, which is x and y, we can fit it with xy form. But if it does have a formula form, we can just fit it. Uh, like this, but I don't actually understand some point they made um, uh, trying to explain um, the need for fit and that one. All right, so um, having a look at the first problem where we have um, the model uh, different interfaces, um, the next thing we're gonna look is um, generalized model argument. So we have seen generalized model interface here. Uh, and generalized model specification solve the problem of having different uh, model specification. So we also have what you call generalized model argument. So like the varying interface we have seen, model parameters differ from implementation to implementation. One more set of argument to memorialize. So this is another problem um, with different argument we have across different uh, models. 
So for instance, uh, this is an example that is given for random forest uh, model function. Uh, some of the three most common argument that are used in random forest here, the number of trees, the number of predictor sample, the number of data point required to make split. So if you look at it here, Ranger, random forest, spark, sparkly are, uh, they do have different uh, names for the model argument. So for the sample predictor, this Ranger is M3, this is, but this one, for the trees, it uses uh, M3, num trees for the so as we can see here the model argument also is something that is really needs to have some kind of unification uh, which is divided in this way so person if comes to save this um, dilemma where you have different kind of um, name of argument across different package so person if unified that so um, just as an example for these three cases, the sample predicted in all cases, it is M3. The number of trees is trees. The data point to split is mean. So this unifies all these three. So you can see passive here in action, it just um, dumb, uh, bring down all those different kind of uh, uh, naming structure to uh, a single commonalities among them. So, uh, one of the philosophy for passing it is that if a practitioner were to include these names in a plot or table, will the people doing those results understand the name? So if you can see here, here, here we have M3, trees, minimum, and so this is something that we understand. Um, so this is one of the philosophy of that. So um, that is um, one of the things that passing tries to uh, generalize. So it tried to generalize the model argument to have consistency among different models. So uh, this is um, uh, a function called translate that translate back to see how your model has been done. Right. So the next thing again is engine specific argument. So we can see here these arguments, they are some of the argument that are common use in these um, in these um, packages, but there are some arguments that are specific maybe to Ranger. There are some arguments that are specific to Random Forest. There are some arguments that are specific to this package. So how can we specify those specific arguments? Um, since we now say that okay, we make the argument common among all of them. So if all of these packages use this, what about the specific argument is, uh, uh, that we can specify by Ranger? So this is where we have engine specific argument. So person is separate model argument into two categories. We have more main argument. That is where we have seen where it is generalized. So the main argument are generalized across all the package, but the engine argument, these are either specific to particular engine or use really. So as we can see here, this is the something random forest where well, we specify here the argument, the common uh, argument, main argument, um, trees, mean, but the specific argument are set inside the engine. So here you can see we, we have bubbles which are specific uh, to the random forest. So that is um, engine specific argument. Um, so uh, that is all about creating model. Um, any question before we proceed? Right. So, um, after creating the model, um, the next thing obviously is to use the model. Um, so naturally, if you pitted the model is now used model. So we want to try to use the model output or summary to do different kind of tasks. For example, we can plot or print or examine the model output. So for that, um, this is our model that we fit. Uh, we can use this function, uh, this, uh, uh, these to see uh, what are the model parameters. So this is an example here where we uh, create the model output and we use to see the class type. And this is the output for the model we have fit previously. But there are some things we can look at here. The model, the class of this model is matrix which is something that we is non-tidy to use uh, 
we always want to use um, table or data frame uh, in some sense. Also, we can see that it does have some roles uh, level. So here, these are some of the issue we can see. Existing method in base R produce a matrix that is not highly reusable data structure because it constrains the data to be a single type. So you can see here the output here among many base R is matrix, um, which is a single type like um, uh, in numeric, uh, but sometimes we may need not to have a single type, which is numeric. We can have, uh, uh, we may need to use data table um, where we have different kind of uh, stuff in the data frame. Uh, another thing problem is uh, um, consistency among the column names. So you can see here, we have uh, this is different in some uh, packages. So here they say consistency of the column names. For LM object, the column for the list test statistic is this, but for the other models is different like this. So this creates some kind of confusion, also non-consistency. Um, so personally want to make all of this um, inconsistency uh, uniform. So these additional formatting are hindrance because we can change this, but um, they are hindrance to, because we need to uh, do some kind of formatting again. So this brings us to one of the principle of tidy model ecosystem is that a function should return values that are predictable, consistent and unsurprising. So, uh, here we want to change the structure or the output of some of the base R, which they produce metrics. And sometimes they have um, rows uh, naming and also we want to change them. As a solution, the Broom packet has made method to combat many types of model of the two tidy structure. Uh, so here we can see the same stuff, um, the model that we fit, we can use Broom package here. And now here, as you can see here, we have some kind of consistency. If you look at them here uh, as a, a tidy form, we don't have a, a level for the rows. Um, uh, you can see now the broom, we create a column here, which is time. And now it's not, uh, we create a column and name the column. Also, you can see here, uh, it is no longer uh, some stuff like that in which different package um, bring different kind of statistics. So it, make everything to be unique. Um, so here we have p-value, for instance, we have statistics, standard error and stuff like that. So uh, this is uh, one way in which um, Pasnip tries to make the output of our model, the pitted model to be a tidy form. So this solved the many problem that we have seen in which uh, some columns name, uh, because this one, uh, when we try to do some kind of analysis, it can give us an error. And also we have the row uh, naming, which is also not um, a tidy uh, approach. So Parsnip um, uh, comes with Broom package, uh, which actually change our output of the pitted model to become tidy uh, one. Also we have the this function glance also, it basically change the model to table structure as we can see here. And the next thing will finally, uh, after we use the models to see um, some statistic or plot some stuff is to make predictions. Now, as we have seen uh, before, uh, the base R models sometimes they do not always return table. So there are three ways in which Parsnip makes it consistency, consistent. The first one is it always return a table. So some base R packet producing the similar data type from prediction function, example, numeric matrix, character matrix. So what this means is that what we're gonna have is that the prediction result will always returns a matrix. Um, I mean, it all it will always returns a table. As we can see here, uh, this is uh, the data frame here. We slice it, and this is our fitted model. And we sub, uh, provide um, a new data here. And as we can see, this is a table. The next one is column names are predictable. So what does that mean is that the column names in Parsnip are always predictable. 
in all the models that you're gonna use, the prediction, if it is numeric, you will have this dot print. And why we have dot in that some uh, columns names in tidy approach may have an argument or um, a column name complete uh, print. And so we use dot print to defy it. So if it is classification tags, you have print class. So as we can see here, uh, that is the second uh, rule. Column names are always predictable. The third one is that return the same number of rows as in the data set. So here, as you can see, we slice the first five. Um, and now here, the prediction returns the five arguments. So these are the three rules in which the prediction always abide by these three rules. The first one is it returns table is always. The second one is column names are predictable. So it has some consistency among all. The column names are the same along all the uh, model that we're going to use and always return the same number of uh, rows are we going to see. So this is also another example, uh, as we can see here. Uh, this allow us also to uh, easily bind some prediction with the data set we have. As we can see here, we have our data set and uh, we uh, make this prediction. And also here we have another one where we bind it together. So this allow us to bind many uh, prediction and we can see it in one go. So um, why do we standardize all this? So they say a main advantage of standardizing the model interface and prediction tab in person is that when different models are used, the syntax are identical. So this is one of the greatest advantage of using Parsnip. So when we use different models, the syntax are the same. All we need is just to change some bit. So for example here, what we're gonna try to do is, uh, this is the same example we run before, but now we want to um, uh, run um, uh, tree based classification. As you can see here, what we need to change is just to change the models classification and the, everything is the same, it's pretty the same. So it becomes easy to reuse the same existence code to uh, make prediction. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see here, we provide the, uh, which engine, um, I mean, which uh, uh, mathematical function is, which is the sitting tree. Uh, also the engine we can set it. So this is the only part where we make changes in the pipeline, but everything, the pit in the model and also binding, everything is the same. So it, one of these allow us to make the existing code reusable by changing few fat um, in uh, model specification to run many model at the same time. So that is uh, making prediction. Uh, uh, then the next thing is uh, something called um, describe. Uh, so what he discussed here is that uh, there are some kind of adjacent packages that exhibit the behavior of uh, Parsnip. Uh, one of the package is this cream package, which actually allow us to do some kind of classification uh, techniques called discriminant analysis, uh, which you can use uh, the same structure with um, Parsnip. So here, as we can see here, we generate the data, we call the library. And here, this cream flexible, it just, we, here we as we find the architecture, or I can say the mathematical function we want, um, here we set the engine here, the same. So this is basically uh, something uh, that is not in Parsnip, but adjacent function that uh, they exhibit the same uh, structure with Parsnip package. Uh, so here, this is an example. This example is not from the book, but um, is from Parsnip, uh, I mean, this cream package page. Uh, and I just, uh, you just copy it and uh, just to show that this is just the uh, changes we have. As you can see, everything will be the same. Um, the, the way we uh, fit the model, uh, we specify this and we set the engine and we fit. Uh, so yeah, so this is the consistency they uh, aim in that everything will have some kind of level of consistency across the fitting model of different kind. Uh, so the next one is um, tools, for creating model specification. So 
this is the last part of the chapter, which says, um, since the person creates something which is consistent among different models, so it makes sense to create some kind of boilerplate code for tidy models and just change some stuff along the way because I mean, it's really the same for every model you want to fit. So the use model packet is helpful uh, way to create a boilerplate code for tidy models. So uh, what you need to give is just um, give the data frame and the model formula. And when you give the data frame a model formula, it will automatically create a boilerplate code that you're going to use. So let's uh, here we call the package and here we provide the mod formula here as you can see and it will automatically create this specification for us um, so you can see here uh, so um, what we all all we need is just to um, edit and copy and uh, uh, make some changes to uh, fit it to our need but one thing it will not do okay this is also another one for limnet uh, it will automatically generate, generate the code um, for you. Um, all you need is just to make some uh, edit and that suits your needs. But uh, one thing that cannot be automated is um, resampling method. The code template requires the user to choose the R sample function that is appropriate. So uh, this is one thing that cannot be done, I think, um, done uh, for path names. So you need to uh, select the resampling method uh, but it will automatically generate this kind of boilerplate code that is common among different kind of models. Uh, another uh, tool is Parsnip adding. So uh, R Studio comes with another adding uh, Parsnip uh, that can also be used to generate a boilerplate code that can be used to uh, fit models or specify the model and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so uh, that is all about the chapter, um, fitting everything together. Uh, so to create a common interface, uh, we can see uh, three, what we can do is give the more mathematical model with a linear regression and stuff like that, uh, set the engine implementation and set the mode if needed. And also we have seen argument can vary whether we have main argument or, um, or sp specific argument. So, for the main argument, we um, have some consistency among all the models, but some arguments are specific to the particular engine. And we use, um, we use engine specification to provide them such as bubbles, num thread. Uh, also, we have seen uh, predictable behavior of uh, predictions. Um, it is always table and tabular, same number of vibration uh, for if we use prediction function. So, um, this is the last part of the chapter, which summarize what we have seen here. Um, this one is all what we have seen in the previous chapter, uh, but here is what we have seen in this chapter to set the model, set the engine, and that is end for this chapter. Uh, so as I said, this chapter is really small. Um, yeah, so um, the next chapter, basically um, what we will see, it combine a workflow in which we can combine the future engineering of recipe and passing it uh, into a single workflow. Uh, but now at this chapter, we, can, we have seen how we can use passing package uh, to provide um, consistency among uh, different model interfaces and uh, consistency among predictable uh, behavior among uh, the prediction output among different uh, uh, implementation right so um that is it um any question um so um i think i maybe stopped sharing that was great thanks sean all right so any question before we no question. You you asked about um, fit and fit X Y, and there's been quite a bit bit of discussion in the chat about it. I don't oh. know if you. Oh, followed. okay. No, 
I have not followed. What, so what is that? <laughs> I, I don't feel best to explain. I was doing a lot of question asking as well. <laughs> All right. So who can chime in and explain to us what that means, fit X and fit, <laughs> fit and X, Y? I mean, um, it, so it basically means that um, when you use fit X, Y, it doesn't do the contrast coding. So if you've done it in, say, your recipes beforehand, you probably don't want to do it in fit, I don't think. Okay. Um, but having said that, um, I've only ever used fit, but I've really not done that kind of modeling with it that often. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember off the top of my head because I don't actually have the code directly available to me. Let me have a quick look. All right. I I'll just put put in the chat as well. But there's a there's this line about using fit and predict. Although maybe maybe I'm. Mm. Okay. Although I don't know. Hold on. I think I've. I think that's actually fit as in the parameter of the sorry of the object, not as in using fit the function. But maybe that's an argument for trying to use fit x y is that <laughs> you can get those things mixed up. Yeah, so I'm just looking at my um, looking at my code testing code here, um, and as far as I can see, I've only used fit throughout, but I don't think any of these are using uh, categorical variables. And if you've got a categorical variable and it's got a lot of levels, you probably want to leave out anyway. Um, yeah, I don't have a good example here that would suit uh, when you would use fit x y. So I presume that's probably why I haven't uh, why I haven't used it. Okay. So for now, for me, um, I'm not quite sure when I should use the fit X, Y, and um, fit X, and um, fit. So, um, but I just assume if I want to work, I would just use fit <laughs> for now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean- uh, yeah, I guess fit. if you just, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, like, I believe that like, even, even I've used fit itself, like I haven't really used fit X, Y, but uh, you know, reading the book itself, it seems like uh, you know, if you're doing the pre-processing stuff, uh, mm -hmm. uh, creating the dummy variables, encoding everything. Yeah. Uh, you know, for the sake of consistency, you should use fit X, Y, um, because, you know, you're not letting the code to decide on its own whether it's a categorical variable and it should be created, um, you know, a dummy variable should be encoded from it. So, you know, just for the sake of consistency, uh, we should be using uh, fit x y i i think so yeah I, I think i think i would agree with that um so one of the things that i would say is um if you don't it's better to be in practice of using something like doing your dummy coding in the recipe instead yep. uh just from a tidy models country mm -hmm. um uh, workflow perspective but <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's quite possible that some of us, uh, <laughs> including myself, are certainly a bit lazy. So we just haven't put it in there or thought to do it because we're still thinking in the old R language or the old way that R does it. And I think that's where the problems come. You need a bit sometimes in order to actually create a better workflow and a better structure, you need to um, need to do something that's a bit more laborious as opposed to actually so going around and putting dummy coding in yourself and that's benefit because it makes you think about your dummy coding the levels in your factors and whether they are actually useful and you should be using them or not and it will force you to investigate them so I completely agree I think you should be using fit x y for that particular reason mm. yeah totally I agree with you I mean, one of the problems that we face in this, um, you know, one, these models and uh, these packages is that at times they can oversimplify stuff uh, and th that can lead to, you know, unknown errors, uh, like the classic cases of uh, that scikit-learn that was, you know, by default, it, it implements L2, I think L1 or L2 regularization, uh, even, even if you don't specify it. Uh, so, like uh, I, I read that, you know, uh, a bunch of scientific papers got redacted because, uh, you know, it was automatically using a regularization, whereas the authors didn't know about it. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, right. So um, 
Yeah, so I was thinking, um, so the study models have, um, I was thinking like this torch they are doing separately. Um, I was thinking, why don't it have the same in the same ecosystem with the tidy model? So I can see they are creating different ecosystem with this torch, um, this torch package. Um, I don't know, um, does it have some kind of um, relationship with the tidy models? I think tidy models would have to develop a, like an integration. So, so I think like, I think it seems like a lot of what tidy models is doing is like translating the standard mm -hmm. to, to whatever implementation there is, you know? So I think it would just have to build that bridge, you know, um, in that sense. But that was actually what I was wondering in the chat is if tidy models becomes more ubiquitous in use, like maybe people will start writing packages that makes that easier to do, mm. you know, like, uh, instead of tidy models having to be like, oh, there's 15 different ways of writing, you know, the same thing. Uh, let's figure out how to do it, how to translate it for this implementation. Um, um, yeah. Uh, or maybe tidy models itself developing like uh, modeling uh, extensions or something. I don't know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just so you know, um, you can use, uh, in Parsnip, you can use the show engines and then select the kind of method that you want to use. Uh, so like linear regression, and then it will show you what engines available. And when you do that, um, the uh, what I'm looking at at the moment is the linear regression one, which is actually on the website. But it shows that it's got the, obviously the base R from uh, LM, which is from the stats package. And then it's got a uh, GLM net, which, you know, always will do. Um, it's basically base at this point. Um, and then it's got Stan Spark and uh, Kira Swin, you know, Spark is basically, uh, no, sorry, Kira is basically TensorFlow, isn't it? Um, so that's um, Spark and Kira are pretty good uh, packages. I presume the other, like Kevin's saying, like eventually they'll probably bring the other ones into it. Um, we just probably have to wait and see, I suppose, because it's a really useful system and we essentially need more machine learning libraries and Torch is certainly going to have to go in there because it's incredible. Hmm. All right. Well, so I guess um. Uh, so today's session has ended. Um. Uh, if we don't have uh, much to discuss, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for presenting. And then, yeah, see you all next week. All right. See you all next all right. week. Hey. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Chef. Thanks.